Tyndall from the University of Hull. Um, so we're gonna we've we've obviously got a webinar planned for you. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a set of slides. Um, now you're welcome to stop me at any time and ask questions. I suggest that the easiest way to do that is to use the chat option, which is a, a you just use your keyboard and just type a question into the into the chat. I'll, I'll keep my eye on that. If I see a question coming through, I'll I'll try and respond to it straight away. If there's too many questions come in, I, I won't be able to, and we'll, we'll try and catch them at the end. Okay, so um, let's get straight to it. So I'm going to go through the slides uh, which are available to you. Um, I've probably got too many slides, so I'm going to zip through them fairly quickly. Uh, but I wanted to have plenty so that you could have uh, something to refer back to later. Um, so we're going to have a look at uh, some of the theoretical frameworks and craft processes associated with problem structuring methods, consulting projects. So I'm going to really talk quite informally. I'm going to talk about my own experience. Um, I studied um, soft systems methodology with Peter Checkland at Lancaster in, in 1994 um, and then I went on to do uh, a PhD with Mike Jackson at the University of Hull. Um, since, since that date uh, in the mid 90s I've continuously practiced uh, both uh, in consultancy but also as an academic uh, at the University of Warwick and, and the University of Hull. Uh, my, my primary PSM is, is soft systems methodology. That, that's the one that I, I prefer. You tend to find that people have a preferred methodology. Um, I wouldn't argue that it's any better than the others. It's just the one that, that works for me. Um, I'm also going to talk about causal mapping and the approach developed by Colin Eden and, and, and Fran Ackerman at Strathclyde, uh, another extremely um, effective methodology. And I think um, suits some people better than soft systems methodology. Uh, we don't really know exactly why that is, um, but I'm going to talk about both of those today. Uh, so before we get started, I think it's worth making a distinction between uh, two types of consulting. So expert consulting, which is a, the, the classic type of consultancy, which is really where the consultant is brought in uh, as an expert to to perform some kind of service or analysis and they give some kind of recommendation or answer to a problem. Uh, so for example, accountants, solicitors, advertising executives tend to operate in expert mode and the traditional type of OR consultant would, would work as a uh, in expert mode. So when I, I worked as a, an OR consultant for a number of years uh, in consultancy firms, I was always operating in expert mode. So uh, we would have a client meeting, we would get the data and then we would go away and uh, we would do the analysis on Excel or whatever software we were using and then we'd come back and present our results. So that's a traditional type of uh, consultancy, whereas PSMs operate in what's referred to as a process uh, uh, approach, which is really where um, the, the consultant is, is there to, to facilitate a process with a group of participants. So the, the consultant is not expected to provide the answers or the recommendations. They're there to manage the process. And the participants themselves will be responsible for identifying the problems and for generating solutions. So uh, the expertise is in the process, not in terms of the content. And there's, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, it, it basically goes back to uh, strategic consultancy in the 90s where people found that external experts didn't always uh, have the most ex insightful uh, solutions to strategy. And they started to realize that it was better to develop in-house uh, solutions when it came to strategy. Uh, now, I thought I'd just put a slide up which sort of gave uh, a general overview of the sort of situation where you might expect to be using problem structuring methods. So th these are the classic uh, scenarios. So unstructured problems, complex situations, or where there's a need for strategic thinking. Normally, there's a group of participants involved in the process. So a senior team 
um, and the consultant is, is facilitating a process with that senior team. And what we argue, obviously the, the, there's lots of people who, who facilitate uh, the difference between the classic facilitation and problem structuring methods is that we tend to use tools. So we're much more analytical, we're much more tool oriented than your average facilitator. Um, and we use tools to express views, to, to capture views and to support conceptual thinking. And, and that's, that's where I think the real value is in, in problem structuring methods. So what do we mean by unstructured problems? Um, well, <clears throat> th this definition comes from, from Mingus and Rosenhead, which is really the classic text on problem structuring methods. So unstructured, unstructured problems were seen to involve multiple stakeholders, multiple perspectives, conflicting interests, various types of uncertainties and significant intangibles. And PSMs offer a way of representing the situation that will enable participants to clarify their predicaments, uh, converge on a potentially actionable mutual problem or issue within it, and agree on commitments that will at least partially resolve it. So you can see it's much more of a, uh, a management of process and people and views than, than the sort of classic operational research type activity, which is very much data analysis. So I think it is a, a very different area. Uh, and I think it's that explains why I think most of us who, who started out as OR people, who've, who've moved over to the softer approaches, find that quite a difficult change. Uh, and, and it is a, a transition that, that, that most of us, are, you know, are pretty uncomfortable with at first. But, but uh, my experience is that when people have a go at it and, and they practice it, they, they, their analytical skills will make that jump. <clears throat> okay, so I've put this slide up because I think this is a really good way of uh, summarizing the process of, of problem structuring methods. So we start with um, a complex situation. Can you see that mouse arrow, Gavin? If I sort of use that mouse arrow to point at things? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we start off with a complex situation. I think that's that's important. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but uh, it is important to to accept that when, you, when you're dealing with strategic issues, when you're dealing with complex problems, you are going to be facing a complex situation. And I think it's important to recognize that in PSMs, we are very humble about that. So we, we're not coming in believing that we can understand all of that complexity. Um, in fact, we, we are absolutely assuming that we can't, that it's too complex, that, that actually we're going to do our best with it, but essentially any complex situation is going to be outside of our ability to fully understand it. And we assume that we're going to be working with a group um, of people, and we assume that that group of people will include different views different ideas about what the problem is um, and that we're going to have to work with those different views. And our first step, therefore, is to try and express that situation uh, in a situation summary. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. But the key thing here is that we want to include people in that. We want to ask people, what do you think is the problem? You know, how do you see the situation? And then we want to try and capture that. Um, so we are we are being subjective. We are allowing those different views, but we are trying to be analytical as well. So um, we are trying to capture that in some kind of a analytical summary. That will lead us on to some modeling, which is where we sort of try and use our more of our operational research capabilities here. Uh, the modeling is going to be conceptual modeling in PSMs as opposed to quantitative modeling, but it's still modeling and it still has that sort of operational idea of trying to capture something uh, in a model. And then that leads us into a discussion about, okay, so you know we've looked at the situation, we've identified issues, we've done some modeling, what are we actually going to do? How are we going to take this situation forward? 
And I think it's important to recognise that, that that is very much a discussion, that we don't assume that the modelling uh, and the analysis is going to have some kind of solution to anything. It's going to be really just about helping people to think about the situation, try and deepen our understanding of it, but essentially the action plans are going to be um, identified through a discussion and that's it and that that action plan will change the situation but again we don't assume that it will improve the situation obviously we hope it will but very much at the heart of PSMs is the idea that when you try and make changes to a problem situation that's complex that, that, that you know you, you may not improve it that, that there may be complexities that you didn't fully appreciate that when you try and make changes those changes may or may not improve and so therefore in principle this this situation is never ending that we're going to be going around this experiential learning cycle uh, forever because that's the nature um, of organizations uh, over time okay so <clears throat> i thought it would be useful at this point just to talk about some some project scenarios i think one of the things that people really struggle with with PSMs, I mean, I've been teaching PSMs now uh, for 20 years, and and uh, obviously I've seen lots and lots of, of of MSc students at Lancaster and Warwick grappling with PSMs. Also, uh, I've been teaching um, uh, MBA students at Warwick for, and Lancaster and, and Hull for for 20 years. So I've seen lots of people trying to sort of grapple with PSMs and, and get a handle on them. I think one of the problems that people have is that. PSMs are so very flexible uh, and uh, can be used in all types of situations that they're, they're quite hard to get a handle on. So I thought I would talk about some classic project scenarios. So the classic one is, is a practitioner uh, facilitating a workshop with a group of people. I think that's the classic PSM scenario. And if you look at the textbooks, you'll see Peter Checklin, Colin Eden, John Friend talking about that type of scenario. But there are other types of scenarios which, uh, where PSMs work really well. Uh, strategic coaching is, is a scenario which I personally enjoy immensely. So over the last five years, I've been tending to work more one-on-one -on -one with senior managers as opposed to doing workshops because uh, I really enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with senior decision makers. Uh, it's a different style of, of working because it's a confidential uh, space. So I can work with a senior manager uh, in a way that they can be much more open and, and, and honest about how they see complex situations that they're facing in, in ways that they probably wouldn't do if, if they were working explicitly with a group of people. Uh, it also en enables me to be much more analytical. So rather than working as a facilitator and, and managing a process, I can actually be, be much more analytical and get involved in the analysis, which as an analyst, I, I really enjoy the analytical work as opposed to the facilitation work. So strategic coaching I found to be very effective and very enjoyable if you prefer to, to be more analytical in your practice. Um, Applied research, uh, PSMs have been used a lot in applied research projects um, at places like Lancaster and Warwick. Um, <clears throat> the the, the modelling language of, of soft systems methodology, for example, and also uh, causal mapping is, is very, very rigorous and, and very, very good for structuring qualitative data. Um, so. Uh, if you are sort of working more in an applied research format, so you've got funding bodies, maybe you're an academic, or maybe you're working in a situation where people want a more research type project, PSMs really work really well there. Um, if you're interested in any of these project scenarios, just, just send me an email. I'll, I'll be very happy to point you in the direction of relevant reading. Uh, the fourth one, stakeholder engagement. Uh, we've seen a lot of PSMs used for stakeholder engagement. So perhaps where um, uh, a funding body or, or a government department wants to collect state, stakeholder views on a particular topic, then again, you can run workshops which are primarily aimed at gathering qualitative data. 
so for example at Warwick we did a big project for the Department of Transport um, I did a project for the Department of um, the Public Health Service of Wales which was really collecting stakeholder data again really really good way of doing it so it's not just about facilitating workshops you know you can use these tools in in, in you know, quite a wide range of 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 of, of projects Okay, so what does a typical project look like? Well, uh, this would be my classic scenario where I had a workshop one, workshop two, workshop three, uh, where the workshop one is about expressing the, the situation or, or trying to develop a situation summary. Um, workshop two is where you go into a bit more analytical work, where you start using the modeling languages. And then workshop three would be where you bring everybody together and say, okay, what are we gonna do? You know that's when we start to think about action planning and as this is as this process goes on and this could be over a week it could be over a month it could be over six months uh, what we find is that as people step back and reflect on the situation then their, their views of the situation start to change and develop um, and for me I find it very beneficial to be able to leave gaps between these workshops so that people's subconscious can can work on the situations and start to develop ideas however there, there will be situations where you, you don't get access to people for, for for a long period of time and maybe you need to complete this work within a single day or even maybe a single af afternoon um, I've had many discussions with Colin Eden about this, where Colin's work tends to be very high level with very senior stakeholders, and he can only get them together for a very short period of time. So he needs a process which which can begin and end in a, in, a, in maybe two hours, maybe three hours. Um, the work I tend to do tends to be over longer periods of time where I like to really immerse myself in the situation, but that's just really, uh, my preferred mode of operating you, you can do both so if we just have a look at the first workshop um, now I'm going to go through these fairly quickly uh, but I just wanted to throw them up uh, these are tools which have been shown to work really well for exploring a complex situation so we've got rich picturing from soft systems methodology we've got causal mapping from Colin Eden Frank, Ack Frank Ackerman um, so you'll you'll find that explained in Soda or Journey Making or, or the latest books called Making Strategy. Um, system Dynamics also a great tool for exploring complex situations. Um, um, in the Netherlands, they've been doing what they call group model building, which is where they get a group of people together in a room and they build a, a, an influence diagram together to try and represent a complex situation. Uh, I've not done that myself, but I, but I understand it works very well. I've seen some of the outputs of that work and it does look like it works very nicely. Obviously the trouble with system dynamics is that there is a, a technical barrier there potentially to, to the people involved in the process. And uh, so it's perhaps not as user friendly as something like rich picturing or causal mapping, but, but uh, I'm told it works really well. Mind mapping is also a very uh, effective uh, tool, very good at exploring a particular topic or issue. Um, I don't find it great for starting out on a project because uh, at the beginning of a project, you don't know what the topic or the problem is. In fact, we don't want to assume that. Um, so mind mapping works great when you when you know a topic that you want to explore. So it's a much more analytical tool. You put the topic in the center and you break it down but it's not great at the beginning for me because i don't really know what to put in the center of my mind map okay so i'm going to sort of look at rich picturing in a little more depth um uh, in a few slides uh because it's a tool that i've i found really effective for me personally um now some people don't get on with it and we know that we don't really understand exactly why we're trying to do some research on that at the moment but it's basically a free hand drawing of the situation um, the objective is to let people express their views and identify key issues uh, we're trying to get them to step back from their their day-to-day -day situation and look at the big picture 
Uh, now, how you do it will depend on the size of the group that you're working with and the culture of the organization. Um, so I, I, I very much like to do it one-on-one -on -one with client contacts at the beginning of a project. I'll sit a client contact down and interview them and, and draw a rich picture. I'll show you some examples in a second. But you can also you know, take a group of people and let them draw the picture together. Um, so if you've got four people, it's pretty much the maximum I would say for that. If you've got more than four people, you're going to have to split them up into groups and, and that works fine. It's a very nice tool for facilitation because you can set people off and, and get them going. So it's so you can have a group of four people going in a room. And from a facilitator's point of view, it's very easy because you don't have to get involved in that. They, they can do it themselves. And then you can just walk around and make sure everybody's engaged. Whereas some facilitation tools go through the facilitator. So very, very hard work for the facilitator. Now, the downside is it's very difficult to interpret those pictures at the end of the session. So it's very, very important that you get people to make a list of issues in text so that you can then write that session up. So here's a few examples. This was a rich picture I drew uh, for a project we did at the University of Warwick with the, um, the Department of Transport. I'm not going to explain the picture, just give you a sense. Uh, this is another one we did uh, with a small business when I was working at Lancaster. This was another one that I did working. This was back uh, as a PhD student at the University of Hull. Um, here's some pictures. This is a project that we did with a, a general a GP practice. Uh, this was near Lancaster. You can see there's four people working on a rich picture. Uh, you can see they, they're using a flip chart, which is not ideal, a bit too small, I would say. Ideally, this is the perfect scenario. So a nice big whiteboard. We've got four participants working together here on a rich picture. And uh, when I put the pictures up before, um, I was cheating a bit because these these are not the original pictures. So these have been tidied up for recording in a report. But the original pictures were much more messy than that. So it's it's important to realize that when you actually ask people to draw pictures, you're going to get something like this, which is a bit more messy. Now, this is the picture that was drawn by those four people. Now, this is the senior team of a metropolitan local authority. And it doesn't get any better than this. That, that's that's a perfect rich picture. You know, the, you've got all four people involved in that picture. This is their strategic situation. Uh, and if you see on the picture, you'll see there that there's a, a whiteboard with a list of issues. So at the end of that session, because I can't interpret that picture, I need them to write down here the list of issues. So at the end of this session, they wrote down the list of issues. People don't want to do that because they think, well, we don't need to write a list of issues. We know what the issues are, but it's vital for me as a facilitator. It's also important for them because they will forget, you know, at the end of a rich picturing session, which might last maybe two hours, three hours, people will be really, really into the situation. They'll, they'll feel very uh, insightful about it. They'll feel that they know what the issues are. But they will forget all of that. So it's really important that, that, that you take pictures and that you document. Uh, now, here are some rich pictures. Now, these are all drawn by me, but these are client interviews. So at the beginning of a project, what I find is really uh, effective is to sit a client down and essentially interview them, but draw a picture of the situation that they're facing. So this is actually the Department of Education. This is actually a University of Hull. This is actually a manufacturing organization. This is actually a school. Um, and I, I find that this is a great way of doing a client interview because I, I get very frustrated in client interviews because clients give you lots of information, but I, I just can't remember it all. I, I try and make notes, but I, I just can't make notes quick enough. If I draw a rich picture of, of what they're telling me about the situation, I tend to be able to remember it later when I write it up. This is a, just a, a few more pictures. This is uh, the Public Health Service of Wales. Uh, here, what you can see is that they're actually doing a rich picture there. You can see that I've, I've created a space by sticking 
flip chart paper onto a wall. In this workshop, we actually had about 25 people. We had them split into about five groups. So that's all going on in, in, a, in a large wall uh, room. We also had them doing some oval mapping, which I'll talk about later, which is what you can see on the right hand side here. Um, often, if I, if I don't know the organization very well, I'll do both rich picturing and oval mapping as a way of just covering my bases, just in case they get on better with one of the tools than the other. This is a, a project that we did with the Trussell Trust um, a couple of years ago. Again, just showing some oval mapping and also some rich picturing. OK, so if you've got any questions about that, just fire them through onto the chat. Uh, I'm going to go through a few more slides, and I'll, but I'll watch for, for questions coming through. Now, I'm going to say a little bit about the modeling languages I use. I'm going to have to go really quick with these, but I thought I'd, I'd mention them just, just for completeness. Um, so the, the modeling tools that I find really effective in practice for my uh, projects are the Business Model Canvas, uh, the Purposeful Activity System Language from SSM, and the causal mapping from SODA or journey making, which was developed by Colin Eden and Fran Ackerman. So why business modeling? Well, it, it, it wasn't really a, a choice that I made to study business modeling. It's just that in my, in my uh, action research uh, practice, so I, I do, I'm constantly doing projects. I just constantly seem to be working on business models. And so I started to, to pursue that. Uh, and there's been a big growth in that in that area within the literature as well over the last sort of 10 years. Um, now, uh, just very quickly, this is a, a classic notion of a business model. And it's been really what, what makes it so attractive to me is that in PSM work, you often find yourself talking about the organization as a whole. That's very difficult unless you have some kind of a, a concept. Um, so if you have a if you have a workshop where people are discussing that, uh, it's very difficult unless you've got some way of facilitating that discussion. So uh, the business model concept is something that we've been using for uh, for a few years now, and uh, we find that 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 uh, clients find it easier than the purposeful activity system language from SSM. So here it is. It just says that when you're looking at an organisation as a whole, there are these nine building blocks um, to conceptualize uh, the organization as a whole, the value proposition, the customers, the customer relationship, the channels, which is what's represented here. And then you've got uh, revenue and cost at the bottom. And then you've got key resources, key activities, and key partners. OK, and here's an, just an example. Uh, of a, of a business model canvas we, we did for the Trussell Trust. Um, the good thing about the business model canvas is, is that it's been used a lot. You know, So there's a lot of practice going on in the UK right now around the business model canvas. So there's lots of experience, lots of support, lots of great videos on YouTube about how to use it. Uh, and it's also spawned an industry in canvases. So you've now got lots of people creating canvases uh, mission model canvas, the lean canvas, the value proposition canvas, product canvas, enterprise canvas. I've also thrown in the viable system model in there because I like that as well. Um, we're also creating our own canvas at the moment called the ethics canvas uh, for use with business analytics. Uh, it is it is a very very nice sort of style of 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 of, of capturing data on organisations or processes as a whole. Uh, the mission model one is is quite interesting, I think, for those of you in the public sector, because it is it is an attempt to try and capture uh, a public sector style notion of, of 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 business model. So that's the business model canvas. I know I'm going really fast, but I just thought I'd just give you a obviously it's such a sort webinar that it's better just to sort of give you a sort of sketch of these things. Now, the purposeful activity system concept from Soft Systems methodology is a fantastic little modeling language. I, I absolutely love it, um, but it is quite tricky to pick up. Uh, I've been teaching it for many, many years. Our students find the business model canvas much easier to pick up, but it, it, I think if you like modeling and you're analytical, it's so powerful. Now, 
you know, I'm not going to be able to 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 describe it very well in the time I've got, but uh, I'll have a go because I, I thought it would be useful just to throw it out there. Now, the great thing about um, this this concept is that you can use it descriptively to capture how things are. You can also use it creatively to think about how things might be. And you can model anything which involves human beings trying to do something with a purpose. So you can model organizations, business units, services, processes. You can even model change projects. And the basic idea is that you conceptualize those reference, those real world things as purposeful activity systems. Uh, now, in order to do that, you need to define your system and uh, we also build an activity model. And the definition tries to say what the system does, how the system does it and why. Uh, and the activity model tries to put the activities together. So just just very quickly, so you imagine a cinema. If so what, what kind of a system is a cinema? Well, is it a system to show blockbuster movies in order to achieve high volume and obtain maximum profits? Or is it a system to show artistic movies in order to present people with creative new ideas and support the culture of a local population? Well, of course, those are two different conceptualizations of a cinema. Now, neither are wrong, neither are right. Obviously, it's up to the client organization to choose which way they would prefer to, to view it. Um, a school, is it a system to ensure children score highly in exams in order to enter a good university? Or is it a system to develop individuals with the ability to think critically and help change society? Of course, you know, there's no wrong or right there. Um, at the moment, if, if you look at most schools in England, you probably see it's more of a pragmatic view um, on the left. But obviously, uh, what we're trying to do here is explore different ways of seeing that, that school. Now, in practice, you can develop it, these ideas. I've just put this example up. This, is, this was a model we did of the Trussell Trust uh, to help us think through you know, what kind of a system is the Trussell Trust. And this enables stakeholders to, to, to discuss their views um, about the, the, the organization as a whole. Uh, in terms of how you do that, uh, in terms of the activity model, then you, you start off by brainstorming activities. Notice they're all uh, verbs, and then you'll put them together into a model. Okay, that's that's you know obviously going to take you time to build up that model. How much detail you go into depends on on what you're trying to use the modeling for. If you're just thinking about strategic views of the organization or alternative views then you don't need to go into great detail with your your modeling. Uh, you know, Brian Wilson, who, who likes to build really detailed models, go, goes into the hundreds and even thousands of activities. Um, Peter Checkland, who, who tends to be more interested in looking at alternative views, likes to keep it more around the sort of 10 activity mark. Um, for me, it just depends on, on, on the level of detail that the client can cope with, really. So here's just a few pictures. Here's an example from Network Rail. A group of uh, uh, participants here were developing uh, a new design for a process using the modeling language. Uh, and here, this, in this workshop, we had four groups. Here is one of the groups presenting their, their idea for a new design for a particular process. Okay, now if you're interested in, in looking at that further, uh, you might want to have a look at uh, a paper that I wrote around teaching SSM. Uh, I'll give you the, the, the reference later. Ah, there it is. Um, so there's some further reading. Uh, the classic text uh, for PSMs is, is there at the bottom, Rational Analysis for a Problematic World. But if you're interested in SSM, have a look at Checklin and Poulter, 2006, Learning for Action. Okay, again, if you've got any questions on that, you know, fire them away in the chat and I'll try and pick those up um, as we go forward. Now, just before we sort of finish off, I'll just give you a quick um, uh, view of causal mapping. Now, causal mapping is, um, you know, another really fantastic methodology developed by Colin Eden and Fran Ackerman. Um, 
it's based upon a theory of how people perceive a uh, situation. So the modeling language is actually scientific in that sense. Um, the idea is, is to build up a causal map of how someone makes sense of a situation. And also you can do it in a group. We tend to call that oval mapping. Um, so really, how do you do it? Well, it's, it's a word and arrow uh, modeling language. So you, you, you take ideas and you link them together with arrows. So here's an example. Uh, this is part of a causal map. Um, and if you sort of look, um, this is looking at uh, a situation within an organization. So if we look at uh, the idea, so here we've got don't tolerate poor, poor performance, and that leads to maintain, support, and develop good industrial relations, and we've got linkage of pay to performance. Okay, so we're trying to link ideas together until we have a more holistic view of a particular problem situation. Uh, and the idea is that we end up with um, uh, this type of a shape, where we end up with um, goals surfacing at the top. Um, and the idea is that it helps people to understand how they see the situation and also the implicit goals they have about how they would like to take that situation forwards, or they're basically their long-term strategic goals. You can also, you know, deliberately try what, what's, what's called a, a, an action-oriented map, whereas you put what you want to do in the center of the, the map and then ladder up asking, you know, why you want to do that, what that would lead to, the, the consequences, and ladder down for, you know, actions for how you would achieve that, that action that you want to do. And that, that's a very good way of doing uh, action plans. And there's an example there of a simple causal map about why I might go cycling, which you can have a look at in your own time. Um, over mapping is where you're going to do it with a group of people. Uh, it's called over mapping because initially uh, people used oval post-its to build up those maps. Um, and it's, it's a very, very efficient and a way of collecting ideas. You can ask people a trigger question. Like, for example, what, what are the main issues you see in this situation? You can give everybody five post-its and then uh, they put their ideas, one idea per post-it, and then you cluster those ideas back onto a large wall. So here's an example. So the facilitator together with the group will cluster those ideas on a wall. Um, and that, that can be done very quickly, half an hour. So something like you see there on the photograph could be done in half an hour. So very, very efficient. And everybody gets a chance to express their views. Everybody's ideas are up there on the wall. And you, you very quickly get a sense of where the main issues are. You can also, uh, if you feel people want to go again, because when people look at that, it'll often trigger them to, to have more ideas. You can give people maybe another five post-its and do another gather of ideas. So within an hour, you can have a very, very good overview of what are the main issues in that situation. You can also ask people to, to, to create, to give ideas for improvement. So you could then collect all those issues and then have another session where you ask people for ideas for improvement. So within an hour, you know, with a group of people, even up to 20 people, you can have everybody's ideas about what the issues are and everybody's ideas about how to improve that situation, which in an hour is incredibly efficient. Uh, when you think what happens at a classic meeting where people, you know, most most people in that meeting won't even speak. Um, so it, it is a very, uh, a very, very efficient uh, way of, of running a workshop and there's also software available uh, <clears throat> you can go on to back, banksia.com and, 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 and download decision explorer which is uh, a software which is designed to help with this type of modeling there's also um, a group version of that software which we were using here this was a project we did uh, you'll those of you who know Alberto Franco or well, you'll see he's, he's there in that photograph uh, he's doing the next webinar in a few weeks uh, but this is a project that we did for the Department of Transport you can see everybody's got uh, a laptop 
they're putting their ideas into that laptop and it's going onto that big screen in the background and and, and Alberto is uh, bravely managing all of that data uh, and clustering it uh, through the software. <clears throat> okay, now the, the only downside with the software is that you do get a lot of data and I personally find it quite hard to, to work with that level of qualitative textual data. Uh, Alberto does a much better job of, of sort of managing that, that level of data. Oh, we've got a question. Sorry, I didn't see that one come in. That is quite a long question um, from Ian. Uh, in relation to the process of consultation, have you found a good way to manage the involvement of other experts when using a process approach to consultancy? where you are wanting participants to own the products, but also wanting to stimulate thinking with specialist input, uh, either in terms of knowledge about the problem or in terms of problem solving approaches. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the project, I don't tend to sort of make any d distinction between participants when we've got people in a room like that. So, uh, so I don't tend to make that distinction. Um, I think that the project that we did for the for the Department of Transport, uh, which you're seeing, uh, the data is is there on the screen now. But that's also the picture that uh, you see there with Alberto. Um, we did have workshops. So this this was a this was in a hospital. Uh, we did have experts in the room there, a, a range of experts. We didn't make a, a distinction there. Um, I think that the general rule of thumb with, with PSMs is that you're assuming everybody has equal access to participate. Um, having said that, there's absolutely no reason why uh, you can't integrate expertise into a project uh, overall, uh, but you'd have to be careful about how you <clears throat> manage that in terms of people's expectations so if, if you're if you're going to sort of in, invite people to a workshop where you say everybody's views are going to be taken into account then you need to mean that otherwise your process approach will backfire <clears throat> just very quickly I'm just conscious of the time we can come back to that Ian later um, the, the software enables you to cluster. So here you can see how Alberto has clustered the data and, and given those clusters some, some headings. Um, and uh, the software is very powerful for allowing you to do that. Uh, some more examples there. Now, if, you, if you're interested in, in the oval mapping or, or the causal mapping, you might want to look at those two books uh, where it's explained uh, now, the final workshop is, is just really where you get people together and, and agree action plans. And there's no real PSM tools for that uh, that are specifically designed to do that. Having said that, over mapping, causal mapping, and uh, the modeling languages in SSM, the purposeful activity system, can be used to build action plans. Uh, but I prefer to, to, to keep that final workshop fairly low tech and, and have it more as a standard uh, discussion type. And finally, it's worth remembering that a lot of people will uh, develop their thinking away from the workshops. So um, there's a lot of evidence to show that people's views of situations are really uh, developed subconsciously. Um, and so that happens away from the, the, the formal workshops. And so it's very important to try and capture that and allow that to, to come into the process. Now, just a few advantages and disadvantages before we finish. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so I'm, I'm going to critique PSMs as well as uh, try and sell them to you. So I think the great thing about PSMs is that <clears throat> that they can be used everywhere. I, I mean, I've been teaching MBAs for 20 years. I've never met a manager who said he wasn't facing a complex situation. So all, ma all managers face complex situations. So 
all managers can use PSMs. You can use them in any type of organization. I've used them in, in startups, I've used them in SMEs, I've used them in large org private organizations, I've used them in the public sector, I've used them in the charity section, I've used them individually in coaching. I've never had any problems in any of those scenarios. Uh, they have been developed through practice. You know, it's one of the good things about PSMs and OR in general, I think, is that, you know, we know we have a good history of practice. Peter Checklin, John Friend, Colin Eden, you know, Alberto Franco, these are all people who who have extensive experience of practice. Uh, they are linked to the notion of implementation. So unlike a lot of strategic strategic consultancy methods, they are all about thinking about the difficulties of implementation. So it's not just focusing on the analytical side of strategy. It's thinking about how can we actually get people to make changes in practice. And that's often the reason driving participation. <clears throat> and they can be used with individuals or with groups. So like I said before, I've been doing a lot of individual work, uh, but they also work very nicely in groups. Disadvantages. There are no strict guidelines for use. The, you know, Peter Checkland, Colin Eden, John Friend, uh, I think John Friend perhaps has given the most guidance uh, on use, but Peter Checkland especially has kept it very, very open because he's aware of the flexibility of SSM. But that makes it hard to get up and running with the methodology. And, and I see people really struggling with it sometimes. Participation, you know, a lot of the methodologies have been developed with the idea that participation is good. But in reality, it's not always possible. And a lot of senior managers that I've worked with are not open to participation. So they'll work with me one on one in a confidential space, but they won't do openly participatively. So that is a problem, you know, uh, senior managers, strategic thinking, it is political. People don't want to discuss openly their, their, their political views uh, and their strategic views. So it's, it's, a, it's a real problem, I think, for PSMs is, you know, some organizations will be open, will be participative, will allow the discussion to be open, and some managers would just will not do that. Uh, managers may be used to other approaches. So um, some managers are still not familiar with or comfortable with the idea of being open and participative and conceptual. They may expect an OR person to basically go away and produce evidence. And I think this is, one of the big problems that we have with policy, um, operational researchers uh, are often viewed as people who go away and, and, and collect evidence, which is hard and quantitative and objective. And it's difficult, therefore, for OR people to get involved in, 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 in the policy making, which is much more of a discursive, conceptual process. And there does seem to be a, a resistance from the policy makers to, to want to allow that process to be guided by tools and conceptual uh, modeling. They prefer to have a more debating style of policy making. I've got a question there from Ian. Do you find benefit in mixing different parts of PSMs to suit different situations? Maybe where there is some cultural resistance. Absolutely. I mean, I have, I have absolutely no resistance to, to mixing. I think, I mean, I am a, an action researcher, so I, I deliberately try and try different things in practice. So I'm constantly trying to use PSMs in different ways. Um, I have lots of um, case material on that. Uh, a lot of it isn't published actually uh, we're trying to to sort of get gets more of that published but uh, for example um, <clears throat> in the public health service of wales um, 
project that we did, there were some pictures earlier, we actually invented a game, a board game, uh, because we didn't feel, uh, I, I spent some time with the director building some SSM models of the Public Health Service of Wales as a system. And we just decided it was too difficult um, to to do the modeling in the workshop because, because of the nature of the system. Uh, it just turned out that that system had four different purposes and the modeling of that system was gonna be very, very difficult. So we invented a board game that we used in the workshop as a way of getting people to to think about how that system might be different in the future. Uh, oh, we got a, we got a question from Case, uh, which is fantastic. Thanks for tuning in, Case. I mean, Case works with with Brian, um, who um, Brian Wilson, I should say, who 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 another of the pioneers of SSM, uh, who who uses the SSM methodology in a, in a much more analytical and detailed way, which I think is fantastic. Um, is the business model canvas not a protective format which for official use requires membership and payment of a fee? Uh, good question, Case. Um, I suspect there will be some copyright restrictions on that and, and you should, if you want to go to strategizer.com, which is a website, uh, you might want to check if, if you're going to use it, it's, for example, in the government department. Yes, definitely I should check that. Um, we we are using it sort of more uh, within a research context. Um, uh, we, we don't face the same sort of level of, of, of copyright. Uh, data that we're using is subjective rather than objective. So again, you might get resistance from some managers who really expect OR to be producing more objective um, outputs. Um, client may be looking for an evidence base um, so again, it comes back to this idea of operational research people should be creating evidence, not facilitating subjective opinion. Again, it's just it comes brings us right back to the expert versus process consultancy view. Okay, now I feel like I've really rabbited on a bit there. If there's any more questions, uh, we've still got a little bit of time for some questions. Um, <clears throat> I'd be particularly interested to hear from anybody that, that's got some policy making experience. We are trying to sort of, uh, Ian uh, uh, Mitchell and, and I have been sort of exploring and, and others have been looking at PSMs within the policy making process, trying to understand how we can work with that. We know that PSMs work really well uh, in general, but policy making is, is a is a very specific environment um, and we are trying to sort of uh, improve our understanding of that. Um, <clears throat> a question from Catherine Hobbs, the ethics canvas sounds very relevant to the public policy domain. Could you tell, I mean, we, we've only just um, sort of been using that th this week uh, with a project that we're doing with the trainline.com. Uh, if you, if you send me an email, Catherine, I'll send you what we've got um, in terms of our research work, but it's not published yet. It's going to be published uh, in a paper, hopefully later on this year, in, in a special issue of, of EJOR around business analytics. Uh, but I'll share what we've got uh, with you, you know, via email if you, if you want to send me an email. Uh, but yeah, it's very much work in process. At the moment, but it's something that 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 we've been doing with uh, uh, the trainline.com, um, and uh, we've been talking with with people who who, for example, are, are very aware of what's been happening with Cambridge Analytica. So, yeah, it's very very exciting uh, what we're doing there with with the ethics canvas, trying to trying to sort of give some kind of methodology around ethics for for data analytics. Okay, we're coming up to three o'clock, Gavin. I don't know. I'm happy to just keep keep going. I, I don't have a restriction, but I assume people will need to to leave at so, at some point fairly soon. 
but you know by all means keep firing questions all right thanks very much giles um you know we had one or two comments through on the questions which perhaps i'll send to you uh, offline uh, a couple of people passing on their thanks and seem to have enjoyed that right. um perhaps if we give everyone a couple more minutes to uh, fire through their uh, questions or comments on the chat yeah I mean I would say I would definitely encourage people to tune in to Alberto that's coming in, in a few weeks because he'll he'll have a lot more to say on, on the causal mapping side of PSMs um, and the work that they've been doing uh, with policy support using uh, the software developed by Colin and Fran and and, uh, um, and the causal mapping methodology and <laughs> just just as a formal reminder then um, Alberto's webinar is scheduled for the same time 3 p.m. on Wednesday the 2nd of May and his title is group decision making opportunities and challenges to policy making great and if anybody has you know any questions you know you're very welcome to email me um, happy to send you you know any material any materials that we've got um, if you've got if you if you're interested in um, using PSMs but you're not really sure how to get going I'm, I'm very happy to sort of uh, give you some pointers on that and, and speak to you on the phone uh, for a little bit just just to sort of orientate you sometimes it's very useful just to get a, a basic orientation uh, especially around thinking about how to set up a project you know what what type of workshops are required how many workshops how you know who to invite how to think about um, the, the level of participation um, but in terms of um, you know sort of getting going with using them yourself I, I, I think there's the best way is, is simply just to start using them on your own problem situations and, and you'll very quickly develop your confidence that way um, but yeah by all means get in touch um, and, and I'm very happy to have a chat <clears throat> and it's, it's quite possible that I've got case material um, that, that's relevant to your to your organization so I'm very happy to send you materials which might I mean I've got a lot of materials which have never been published so um, be very happy to share materials with you that might be relevant to your organization okay I think people are starting to leave now. We've still got a few, a few. I'll, I'll, I'll hang around until everybody's gone. Uh, so if you've got any questions, feel free to, to send them through. Yeah, numbers are dropping di uh, down. Giles, so I think we'll finish here um, and on behalf of everyone that's tuned in, I'd like to say thanks very much for your contribution today. That seems to have gone down really well, very useful. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, the recording uh, will be made available as soon as we can. Uh, so right. thanks, thanks very much for everybody and I'll draw it to a close. Okay, cheerio folks, bye-bye. Thanks Kevin.